The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Introduces once again that intrepid voyager into the unknown seas of the supernatural and the occult, who always manages to return with a pragmatic explanation of what seems to be the inexplicable. Mr. Flaxman Lowe. Now, my dear Gigi, you must show me this haunted house. It's raining too hard to go there now, Uncle Flaxman. But look out the window. Even in the rain, it's lovely. It's so peaceful and sort of beckoning by day. But I'm afraid that some terrible, malign, dreadful ghost lurks there by night that kills and kills to keep it for its own. Well, if that is, my dear, then we must exercise it. But first, we must find out what it is. Our mystery drama, The Shining Man, was based on the short story by E. and H. Heron and written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Bob Caliban and Morgan Fairchild. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and General Electric Citizen Band Radios. I'll be back shortly with Act One. about you, but to me, it seems a pity that haunted houses have gone out of style. Perhaps it has to do with the uncompromising utilitarianism of modern houses. After all, what self-respecting ghost would feel at home without a turret room, a sliding panel or two, and a host of shadowed and twisted corners? So to enjoy our story, let's retrace our steps back to the turn of the century, when walls were wainscoted, ceilings were high and ornate, and the clanking of chains and groans from the grave were enhanced, instead of smothered by insulation and acoustic tile. Oh, I hope he's on this train, Uncle Jack. He was due last night, and he wasn't on the morning train. Well, whatever held him up, it must have been a very important something indeed to keep my nephew Donald away from your side for so long. Oh, it doesn't matter anymore. There he is. John? Oh, darling, Gigi. I've been a thousand years. A million without you. Was the trip worth leaving me abandoned here in London? Oh, just wait you here. Hello, Uncle. Hello, Don. Did you take the position? I did. You are now looking at the brand new headmaster of the Gervan Academy for Boys. Not only that, but I, I found us a house. Oh, I knew the trip would be worthwhile. I just knew it. Congratulations, my boy. Oh, I, I must talk to you about the house, too, Uncle Flax. Oh, there's time enough for that at home tonight. Now, uh, it's a matter of financing. No, 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 nothing to do with that. It's, look, I'll explain later. Well, whatever it is, you know you can count on me. My name is Don Campbell. I'm of Scottish and English descent. But I was educated in Canada and America, where I met and married my wife. Gigi was an orphan, like me. And in 1900, being at that time unemployed, we were overjoyed to accept an invitation from my only relative, Mr. Flaxman Lowe, to visit him in London. While there, I suspect through my uncle's pulling a few strings... I had been offered an interview for a job as headmaster of Girvan Academy in Scotland. The job sounds marvelous, Don. But I knew you. Why do you keep avoiding talking about the house? But that's marvelous, too. But do we need a house? Surely it couldn't have been too difficult to rent something furnished. But the house is furnished, too. And Gigi, I mean, gee, it was too good a thing to pass up. The bargain of all time. Well, what sort of bargain? What, what sort of house? Well, it, it's kind of hard to describe. I mean, it's it's really stunning. High on a ridge. And the view is stupendous. 
Connor Old House, it's called. When you look at it from outside, you'll fall in love with it just as I did. <laughs> and the inside? Oh, uh, well, it's, it's been empty for quite a few years, and, well, there's work to be done there. I've already arranged with the agent to hire a man to clean it up. And the price includes the furniture. Don, are you trying to tell me you bought this house without my ever even seeing it? Well, not exactly bought. Just, just a down payment. Oh, but, darling, I tell you, it was such an incredible bargain. Why is this house such an incredible bargain? Well, I suppose because it's supposed to be haunted. Oh, that's great. Well, Gigi... I couldn't pass up an absolute steal like this. I can't describe to you how lovely Connor Old House is. Clothed in ivy, on the highest hill within its horizon, with the green grass tumbling down to the cliffs and the dunes and the endless sea beyond. And the ghost you spoke of? Oh, local superstition. And if they bother us by groaning and clanking about, well, there's always Uncle Flax. As a parapsychologist, they're his life work. And he can blow them away just like the mist. Are you so sure? Brandy, Uncle Flack? Yes, thank you. You're not joining me? No, thanks. I, uh... Oh, well, I only got you away from Gigi, so I'd have a chance to talk to you about the house. All right. What's troubling you? The house is supposed to... To be haunted. By whom? What they call the Shining Man. The Shining Man. Uh-huh. Hmm. What does that mean? Oh, a lot of talk. Gibberish. But I honestly don't know. I, you know, I think a trick of the moon on the windows reflecting. I'm something like that. Oh, I see. Who is the uh, former owner? Uh, Sir James Mackay who had retired from abroad, Central Africa, I think. He lived there with his daughter and a gigantic black who apparently was devoted to him for saving his life in Africa. Why did they leave? Well, they didn't. The daughter, it seemed, had contracted some virulent disease from her African sojourn, and she died while her father was on some business in London. Mm. And the father? The shock of finding his daughter dead on his return was too great for him, and he settled into a sort of melancholy and eventually died. It's not a very pretty history. What happened to the slave? Slave? Yes, the black man. I didn't say he was a slave. Oh, yes, that's right, you didn't. Uh, what uh, happened to him, anyway? Oh, I don't know. Uh, well, let me see. In, in the local gossip, there was something about Sir James accusing him of being responsible for the girl's death, but well, it never came to anything because the black had disappeared and not long after, Sir James was found on the living room couch, dead of apoplexy. His face covered with horrible, livid patches. And this is the home to which you expect to take that pretty young American wife of yours? <laughs> oh, don't be ridiculous, Uncle Flaxman. The tragedies of others have nothing to do with us. A house is not a person. It can't affect us. <laughs> and even if there are any malign influence hovering around. Well, I have the best protection in the world, don't I? Oh, yes? What is that? You. Aren't you the foremost ghost detective in the world? If we run into trouble, can't I coax you to tilt a couple of tables or at least exorcise any demons if they're wandering about? My dear boy, you know I am always at your service, but uh, I wouldn't joke about the unknown, Don. Why... This house instead of any other? Because it's the only one I can afford. And I've already made a down payment. So, there we were. Gigi and I. With all our worldly belongings off for Scotland as soon as we could pack. Of course I should have stopped to write first and waited for a reply, but that isn't my way. I had made a decision. Why waste time? Especially since London was expensive and almost all my money had gone for the payment on the house. And it would be a month before I could expect my salary at the academy to begin. We had to take the train north to Ayr. And then debark and retrace our steps south some 30 miles to Gervan, The nearest town to what I now thought of 
our home. It was a good 25 miles by road, and it was after dark on a blustery, drizzly evening when we arrived at Lanark Inn, where I had stayed before. Happily, the landlord remembered me and had accommodations. Hey, hello there, Mr. Campbell. It's good to see you again. Will you be staying? Oh, just for a night or so, Mr. McTavish, with my wife. Well, bid you good welcome, too, Mrs. Campbell. Oh, but you're a bonny lass, and I can't blame Mr. Campbell for making you his own. <laughs> but, but you look a wee bit chill. Now, come on, Ben, and you'll warm yourself for the fire, the two of you. <laughs> Mr. McTavish was as good as his word. Not only did he have a fire, but he had some warming beer, and with it, some heavenly steak and kidney pie. So, what brings you back to Girvan, Mr. Campbell? <laughs> I'm back to stay, Mr. McTavish. All right. And uh, where would that be? At our new home. I'm going to buy Connor Oldhouse. Uh, you yeah. <laughs> are. My husband can't wait to take possession. If it had been daylight, it would have moved right in. I'd move in right now if I were sure it had been aired and cleaned thoroughly. Mr. Niven, the agent, wouldn't still be around town, would he? Oh, no, he's away home long before twilight. He, uh, he lives quite far down the road. Oh, well, I'd rather see the house by daylight first anyway. We can move in tomorrow. No, I wouldn't haste too much till, uh... Well, uh, till you've had a word with Tommy Niven. Well, of course, we have to see him first. I'll be up at the crack of dawn waiting in his office till he comes in. Well, I don't think in the morning he'll be by. He'll be over to Contrer, I would think, to, uh, uh, to the funeral. What funeral? Uh, well, you see, it was this lad he engaged from the village here to, to clean up Connor Old House. Yes, I commissioned him to do that. Well, what about him? Well, it's not all that easy to get folks hereabouts to to go near Connor Old House, even in the daylight. After all that's happened there. You mean Sir James and his daughter and their unfortunate death? Aye, and then over all that, there's the... Uh, the Shining Man? Aye. Him. Oh, and in front of the lady, I didn't want to... Oh, that's quite all right, Mr. McTavish. Don has told me all about the history of the house. It's sort of exciting, but... Well, I don't really believe in ghosts. I'm not scared. That's my way. Hey, I don't know but what I'd be a wee bit canny if I were in your shoes. It wasn't only the doctor and his daughter. But there was what happened to the tinker as well. And poor slow jock. Oh, no, now, wait a minute. Who's the tinker? And, and who's poor slow jock? Well, here, 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 one at a time. The tinker was a nobody, a tramp, or a... Or a or a bum, I think you'd be calling him in the States. And a couple of years back, he moved himself in. It looked to be as if he lived in the kitchen, quite comfortable and happy for a few days. But then, he moved into the library. And... And? And they found him on the library couch. So James's couch, that was. Stark, raving mad, and at death's door, and his face all over with great black marks like he'd been in a peat bog. <laughs> he just had a dirty face. He probably got caught in the rain and went into Connor Old House for shelter and died quietly of pneumonia. Raving with the DTs, just like poor Jock. What happened to him? Oh, only the good Lord could maybe answer that. But he was just like the tinker, lying on the couch. Only, he was dead. Oh, and an expression on his face only old Clutie himself could have written there. Old Clutie? The devil. Well, don't tell me Jock's face was blackened, too. Aye, mm, just like the others. Oh, here, now, I hope I'm not upsetting you. Oh, no, no, nothing of the sort, just the... The right thing to make us sleep like tops. Uh, well, the toddy should take care of that. But, uh, I just thought you ought to be warned. Come to bed, Don. Why are you watching out the window? Oh, uh, nothing. It started to rain. Typical Scottish food. It can be still. No, I don't. What is it? Don, what did you see? Uh, 
I, I didn't see anything. Go back to bed, Gigi. John, you're looking towards our house, aren't you? Connor house, I mean. Yeah, yes. I, well, I mean, that's the general direction, but it's... I see it. I see what you saw. What? A light. Glimmering like a, like a huge June bug, only it's, it's shaped like a man. Oh, dear Lord, it is haunted, just as the innkeeper said. Look, Don, look, it's the shining man. Wouldn't you say that's a fair beginning for a story of a haunted house? What is it that Gigi has seen or thinks she saw? Some trick of refraction of the light from the inn windows against the misting drizzle of the rain? Or a real light carried by a real person who has no business in Connor Old House? I shall return shortly with Act Two. Long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night. Good Lord, deliver us. An old Scottish saying, and one that shivered through Gigi's mind that night, trickling in icy waves down her spine, till at last dawn coaxed her to sleep. But with the coming of morning, all the night fears seemed ridiculous, particularly in the face of Thomas Niven's cheerful scorn. The real estate agent was a giant of a man, an old Scotland rugby player who boomed and beamed and bubbled with good cheer. Oh, pack of Tommy Rock, the whole thing. Old wives' tales and gossips gabbling, eh? <laughs> that trap was sheer coincidence, and Sir James and his daughter, well, that was tragedy, if you will, but nothing supernatural about it. Oh, what about this boy, Jock, Mr. Niven? Oh, yes, well, Jock. Now, that I do blame myself, Mr. Campbell. I, I should have realized that the boy wasn't up to the job. Never send a boy on a man's errand. Huh? Is he really so young? Uh, not in years, Mrs. Campbell. A man grown in body, that is. But he was a touch, uh, well, you know, not not quite right in the head. Mind you, that would never have interfered with the clean-up job. It was just the sort of thing for him under ordinary circumstances. And he and his mother could always use the money. You say ordinary circumstances... I thought you were telling us that there's nothing extraordinary about... About Connell Oldhouse? No, 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 I don't believe there is. Well, then what caused the poor fellow's death? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Campbell. It couldn't have been the shining man, could it? Oh, good heavens. They've gotten to you with that old gibberish, have they? Well, whatever you heard, <laughs> forget it. There is no such thing. I'm afraid there is. What? I saw it. We both saw it. Last night. Well, well, he seemed to be in Connor Old House. Oh, and you were looking from the village? From our window at the inn, yes. And this would be after dark? Yes. Oh, yes, well, I've seen that myself. Whenever it's misting very heavily. <laughs> that was no ghost you saw, Mr. and Mrs. Campbell. That was Ignis Fatuous, Friar of Lanthorn, if you wish. What? What we call will-o'-the-wisp, honey. Caused by swamp gas, I think. Yes, just the way of it. Sulfuretted hydrogen, actually, rising from rotting vegetation and such, and spontaneously ignited in spite of the damp, so that it glows in the dark. Well, you think that's what the boy saw and that it frightened him to death? Oh, yes, very like. What did the doctor say caused his death? A uh, sheer physical fright, acting on an already faulty brain. Oh, I say hello, that's overdue. He's been on the way for a couple of days. I'm afraid we're in for a bit of bad weather. Shouldn't bother you too much, though, since I'm sorry to say the house isn't ready to receive you as yet. I haven't been able to find anyone else to get over there. Uh, Mr. Niven, before we take any further action, perhaps I should let my wife see the property. Well, now, look, you're not thinking of backing out on me, man. Great heavens, you have the bargain of the century in that house. What I'm beginning to wonder is, why? Oh, I can tell you that. Idle tongue, sheer and simple. How I picked it up myself. You mean the house is yours? But you didn't tell me that, Don. I didn't know, dear. I thought Mr. Niven was only acting as an agent for the original owner. Oh, well, you see, actually, I bought it from Sir James' estate for my grandmother and put it in her name before she died. Uh, never had the chance to move in. So it just stood empty the last two years. I, uh, 
I will say, however, that if you're considering backing out on the sale, in my opinion, you'd be a fool, young man. Well, it isn't a house, Mr. Nick, and it's... Well, it's its reputation. Well, then, Mrs. Campbell, I tell you what I'll do. I do feel a little put out that I didn't have it ready for you, as I promised you and your husband. So, as soon as the rain lets up, since I can't find anyone else, I'll go out and clean the house myself. Well, I shouldn't think a man would want... Oh, my dear girl, I'm a sailor, and you won't need to look at my boat to see what a first-class housekeeper I am. I promise you she'll be shining like a new pin. And not only that, but I'll want to set your mind at rest. I'll spend the night there, too, and show you there isn't a single solitary thing to fear in Connor Old House. I will admit that I had misgivings. I'd even partially allayed them by sending a wire that morning before we had gone to Mr. Niven's office, asking my Uncle Flaxman to come up to Girvan, post-haste, by the next train. But Mr. Niven was so obviously physically powerful that I pushed them aside. If I had known the terror that awaited him and us, I would never... But that is only hindsight. In no time, it was the afternoon of the next day, and Uncle Flax had arrived, and we were briefing him on all that happened in the tap room. Oh, dear, 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 dear. Just listen to that rain. Pity. I'm really very anxious to have a look at this strange house of yours. You don't think it really can be haunted, do you? I mean, you can prove it isn't, can't you? Well, I don't know, Gigi. It may very well be. But I, I thought you were a, a ghost detective. I mean, an investigator who proved that they were fake. All the famous cases. Oh, uh, not all, my dear. Most, perhaps, but certainly not all. Are you trying to tell me that... that there really are such things as ghosts? I think there is such a thing as the human soul, dear girl. A spirit that has its own life independent of the body. I've seen too much evidence of it in my investigations not to believe in it. But it does not necessarily follow that there is some lost soul haunting Connor Old House. I don't know. Now you're really beginning to scare me. I'm really afraid, terribly afraid, that there's some awful, malign, dreadful thing that lurks there by night that doesn't want anyone disturbing it. That kills to keep it for its own. Well, if there is, my dear, then we must exorcise it. But first, we must find out what it is. In spite of the weather, we would have tried to go over to Connor Old House that afternoon, but the driver refused to take his horse out again in that torrential rain. And by the time the rain had slacked off, it was too late, for the long Scottish twilight was beginning to fall. Gigi was lying down before supper when I came downstairs to find my uncle gazing out the window through the peculiar half-light. Uh, Donald, come here. Uh, yes, uncle. Over toward the house, you see that? That light patch in the darkness? Where? The frame by the house as though it uh, came from one of the windows. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I see it. The darker it gets, the more that light glows. It seems to be taking on shape. Is that uh, what you saw last night? Yes, I, I... I think so, but... Could that be a candle or... Lamplight from the house? No, no, the color is wrong. It's not soft and yellow, and uh, there's no flicker. Just a steady blue efflorescence. You think it might be Will-o'-the-Wisp? No. It's too steady. Hello. There goes some lamplight. Moving from room to room, it seems. And the other glow is gone. It doesn't like the real light, it would seem. Hmm. Well, what do you think, Uncle? Without any facts to go on, very little. I only wonder. But I do know three things. What, sir? First, that it is too dark for us to venture out there tonight. Second, that when we do, we will not take Gigi with us. And third, we had better leave tomorrow at crack of dawn. With the first rays of light, and with Gigi still fast asleep, we were off by carriage for the long drive to the ridge. When we pulled up in the cobblestone yard in front of Connor Old House, it was as silent as a tomb. Only the gulls screaming out to sea. Could your Mr. Niven have left already? Do you suppose he missed him? Well, I don't see how he... 
came out here by carriage, so well, he'd have had to use the road. We'd have passed him. It came from the stables. He must still be there. That horse sounds frightened. Uh, come along, Don. You've been in the house before. Now, you take it. I'll take the stables. He left me. I hurried up the stairs of the porte cochere, and after testing the handle, swung open the heavy hall door. The gloom of the wet dawning and the heavy smell of stagnant air filled the great hall as I looked around its dreary emptiness. The silence inside the house was oppressive. I called Mr. Niven's name, but the noise only echoed through the house, jarring on the stillness. I walked almost timidly to the middle of the hall, my footsteps silent on the carpet of accumulated layer upon layer of dust. Wherever Nivet had been cleaning, he certainly hadn't started here. I felt a wave of panic spiral up from my stomach, and I called his name again. Mr. Niven? Mr. Niven? Don? I... It's all right. It's all right, it's only me. No sign of him here. No. You didn't find anything at the stable? No, just a poor horse bathed in a lather of sweat, shine of the blink of an eye. Something has happened to scare him, but not in the stable. Oh, here it seems. I don't see how Niven can be in this house. Oh, why? Well, you can see the dust everywhere. And my footsteps. No sign of any others. He's here in this house. How do you know? I can sense it, and the vibrations are bad. Uh, come, which way are the living quarters? Uh, this way. Including the library? Yeah, right through this door. You seem to be stuck. Yeah. Oh, there. Good Lord. Oh, that smell. The smell of death. Let me pass. No, Uncle. No, I don't. don't. Come, come, help me. I've found your Mr. Niven, I think. Oh. oh. Is this he? Yes. Is he dead? No, I don't think so, but we've got to get him out of here and home before he is. What happened to him? I don't know, but whatever it was, he was trying to run from it when he fell against the inside of the door. Come, my boy, if we're to save his life, we must get him out of here. <laughs> hope you're not listening to this alone. Not that I want to scare you. Yet. After all, we still have no idea what else was inside that room that drove a strong, healthy athlete in the prime of life to the edge of death, do we? For that matter, we don't even know if it is still here. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. And the slidey toes did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borrowed groves and the mom rats outgrave. The where the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. The where the jujubird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. I mention this quote from Lewis Carroll, not because it means anything, which it doesn't, but because it suggests evil incarnate and crawling things calculated to send a shudder to the roots. <laughs> indescribable, fetid odor from that haunted room was so stifling and smothering that it almost overpowered my Uncle Flax and me as we struggled to carry the big, heavy, inert body of Niven from the room. We half dragged him through the door to the relief of fresh air and the carriage outside. How is he, Uncle? In a rather bad way. He needs medical attention as soon as possible. Hey, giddy up! Giddy up! Oh. You think he was scared to death? Like the poor guy he sent up to clean the house before? Not to death, since he's still alive, but something has given him a shock, all right. A profound shock. Something? You you mean the place is haunted? I didn't say that. But you meant it. Perhaps, in a sense. What do you mean, a, a sense? When we opened the door and that awful stench poured out, you, you said it was the smell of death. The figure of speech. 
but I'm afraid only time will tell. Now, hurry now. Get back to the inn. Oh, Mr. McTavish, what's going on? Where is my husband? Oh, he's scrubbing from top to toe with lye soap as Mr. Lowe himself did first. And my uncle? Well, after he carried all the clothes out and started them burning, he went back to the bedside of Mr. Niven. Burn the clothes? Well, what was the matter with the clothes? Oh, I don't know. Contaminated somehow from that evil house of warlocks and ghoulies. John, darling, are you all right? Well, I feel a little as if I'd been skinned alive. Otherwise, yes, it's What fine. do you mean, skinned alive? <laughs> Scrubbing in that strong laundry soap. Oh. oh, can I touch you now? Oh, darling, I want you to hold me and never let me go. Oh, now tell me what happened. What about our house? Our house? Now I wish the damn thing had burned to the ground before I ever saw it. That's what I wish had happened. <laughs> You think you can tell me the rest of what happened now that you're feeling a little better? Oh, well, I could try. But I, I did too. Where, where was, was I? Who, who did you say you were? My name is Flaxman Lowe. Now, you started cleaning the back of the house, the kitchen, the dining room, the pantry, the living room, so on. Hmm? Yes, yes, it's uh, daytime. But I, I got there later than... And I'd hoped, my understand. So suddenly, night was upon you, and you lit a lamp, eh? Yes. So after you lit the lamp, you went into the library, right? Yes. I went to... Oh, oh that, that awful smell hit me and, and turned me sick to the pit of my stomach. I must have passed out. How do you suppose you got to the door where we found you? Oh, well, Woke up again, and the lamp had gone out, but there was this ghastly light. I don't know, I don't remember the damn house. Why didn't I burn it the day I bought it? And when he came to, Mr. Niven told me the lamp had gone out, but Suddenly he was aware that the darkness was clearing. A feeble light was filtering down through it from above. He looked up at the ceiling and saw there an irregular patch of pale, phosphorescent luminescence which grew gradually brighter and brighter. The shining man. When he had the impression that through the radiance above, someone was looking down on him. And through the thickening atmosphere of drowsy horror, choking and revolted by the growing odor, he looked up again. To see what? To see the brightness dim and dark smears show through it, all running together into something that swelled out and downward like a fat, green, white, evil face from which great drops of black, dripping fluid fell like rain. Oh, good Lord. And suddenly, fear and loathing broke his chains enough for him to run to the door where he plunged forward into a dark, red vacancy to remember no more. The place is haunted. By whom and why? Yes, Uncle, why? And who is the shining man? Why does his ghost haunt Connor Old House? I can only answer two of those questions. Which? I mean, I can guess the answers. Who it is and that he is no ghost. As to proving it and the why, that will have to wait until tomorrow. <laughs> again, back at the library. Yeah, at least it smells a little better today. Uh, nevertheless, put your handkerchief over your mouth and nose as I'm doing before we enter it. Now, come over to the couch. Why the handkerchief? Oh, it's simply that I believe the dust in this room is a bit poisonous. Niven inhaled too much of it, hence his condition. It is literally piled up around the couch here. Uncle, look. Above on the ceiling... A long, discolored stain. 
You see that? Yeah. So I should have expected. I uh, think that explains everything. A blood stain on the ceiling explains everything? Well, what do you mean? Oh, wait a minute. Look. What? You see those tracks? A cat has been walking over this sofa. Can you explain that? And what do you mean about the blood stain? My dear boy, the stain on the ceiling has nothing to do with blood. It is simply a patch of mold and fungus. As for what you call cat's footsteps, look at them more carefully and uh, you will see they look more like raindrops. Raindrops? In a perfectly watertight room where the dust is so dry that slightest movement makes it rise like smoke? Ah, the dust. When we came to fetch Niven, I noticed how green and fine it was and how enormous an accumulation of it there was in this room. Why? Because this dust is like the powder in a puffball formed of minute spores. And that's why it's poisonous? Well, I have no doubt that from this dust, as we shall call it, within a few days a specimen of fungus could be cultivated, which would prove to be African in origin. But if the dust is so dangerous, aren't we running the risk? Well, not if we don't inhale too much. On last night, incidentally, I saw that Niven's coat was covered with it and that above the collar and along the upper part of the sleeve as though they had dropped from above was a spatter of gummy marks which corresponded to these so-called raindrops. What else would you call them? Oh, drops from the stain on the ceiling caused by the unnamed fungus I mentioned, which decays as it matures, liquefying into a dark mucilage which drops down, diffusing a repulsive smell, which disappears as it dries and leaves only the dust of the spores. And uh, those raindrops are most certainly what killed the boy, the tinker, and Sir James and his daughter. How? Oh. Well, I would guess that the fungus is singularly malignant, acting through the skin to the brain, and then interpenetrating all the tissues of the body with terrible rapidity, and causing a violent and horrible death. Which Mr. Niven escaped because the drops touched only his clothing and not his skin. Exactly. Oh, I see. But well, what about the light? The, the ghost must have caused all this. Why don't we go upstairs and perhaps we can find out? Look, Uncle. Look. The light. Yes, son, I see it. Now it's gone. It, it, it just quivered for a moment. Uh, where it, would you say it came from? Um, from that dark end of the hall. Between those two doors? Yes, that's where I saw it. But where could it have gone to? Well, actually come from. Which uh, room? Hmm. You take the left, I'll take the right. We searched both of the rooms with a fine-tooth comb, but there was no sign of anything. Then Uncle Flaxman had a brilliant idea. We paced off the width of each room inside, then the total yardage outside in the hall. Between the rooms was a common wall which must, by our measurements, be some three feet wide, but no door in either to a closet. In the hall, we looked at the seemingly solid wall between the doors. Then Uncle Flaxman said, Close your room door while I close mine, Don. Right, Uncle. Now that it's shadowed again in here, back up toward the stairwell. Ah, you see that? A glimmer of light as though it were behind the solid wall. Which means the wall can't be solid. Come here. Hello. Well, there must be some sort of secret room or closet there. Let me see. Uncle. What is it? There's some sort of a catch here to the upper panel. Probably a means of opening it to ventilate the space between the walls. Try it, my boy. Try it. I have it. Oh, oh that smell again. Ah. And look. Good Lord. What is it? I fancy it is the body of the missing black man who was supposed to have worshipped his master and his mistress. Black? But he's white. What's that shining white stuff all over him? A fungus. 
the fungus. The shining man, whose phosphorescent glow on damp evenings sometimes shone through the little window at the end of the closet and scared everyone in the countryside half to death. Not a ghost, but just a poor man who met a terrible death in a coffin of his own making. Horrible. Oh, Don, how horrible. Who was he, anyway? Sir James Mackay's faithful servant. Ah, but remember, I said slave, and I think not so faithful. What do you mean, Uncle? I have always intended to devote myself to the study of Obia. Obia? What, what is that? Voodoo, the fetish worshipping religion of sorcery and conjuration. In the dead man's hands were the remains of two crude figures, a man and a woman, coated with a fungus. You mean he was responsible for the deaths of Sir James and his daughter? Or for wishing his gods to take vengeance on them for the virtual slavery in which he had been held all his life. Poetic irony, isn't it, that the monster he called into being in the end was the means of his own destruction? Oh, that house. I could never live in it now. Don't worry, darling. We never will. What should be done about it, Uncle? It should be burnt to ashes, just as we did our clothes. It's the only way the spirit of evil will ever be exorcised from Connor Old House. <laughs> Same night, Connor Old House went up in a pillar of smoke, its funeral pyre lighting the Scottish night. Interesting that earlier that same evening, Mr. Niven, now recovered, had left the inn for his home. Don Campbell had ridden alone to the post office for a letter which didn't arrive, and Mr. Lowe had gone for a long ramble to blow the cobwebs away, as he said. But who or what? cause the fire. No one will ever know. I'll be back shortly. Being so busy. Mr. Flaxman Lowe has proved and demonstrated that the shining man in Connor Old House was not supernatural. That he wasn't a ghost. When is a ghost not a ghost? All I know is that fungus swathed corpse, desiccated and decayed, but still propped upright in its narrow tomb, will haunt me the rest of my life. Our cast included Bob Caliban, Morgan Fairchild, Ralph Bell, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by General Electric Citizen Band Radios and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.